Hello everyone and welcome to the public space. We were supposed to have Bill Gade tonight to talk about communism, but uh, he is not responsive by email. I'm sure he will join us at some point in the night, maybe he has some technical difficulties. But the news are so insane that I thought, look, I cannot stop the beginning of this show. Uh, how did I get the vision to leave biology to become a broadcast news analyst? analyst? I have no idea, but it was a genius move. We are sitting on a, on a gold mine of news. And so let's get started. But uh, we have, uh, uh, as a reminder to our audience, join Entropy. Uh, this is my favorite platform for super chats because they give a good rate and they don't take your money like YouTube. So it's a great place to send me donations and questions. You can also send questions for free. And you can also participate to our survey of tonight. Do you think this relationship had a causal role in the shooting? Today we are getting a text from the ex-girlfriend of the Dayton shooter and all of my predictions are averred. They, they are, they are proven true. Uh, I, I've often said that polyamorous relationships are extremely dangerous. That the, the, the masculine psychology is not able to handle this. And I think that b because of the jealousy aspect, and I think that the Dayton shooting case may have been caused much more than we originally thought by this kind of circumstance. Now, as I'm saying this to you guys, I see that our friend Bill Gade has connected. And Bill, we are live. How are you doing, Bill? I'm doing fine now that I found you. <laughs> I was in a different, but I can't see you. I only see your photograph. <laughs> All right. Uh, you won't be able to see the video tonight because Google has disabled this feature, unfortunately. And I didn't find uh, yet a way to send to the guest the video. But I can assure you that we're seeing you and the crowd is also seeing me. Uh, it's just a, a okay. problem with Google right now. So, uh, Bill Gade, you, we've been discussing, uh, communism and, and I've been complaining against communism and we thought it would be a great time to talk about your experience with communism. My understanding is that you fled communism. You left the U.S. Well, we got to start at square one. How <laughs> first I entered communism, you know, uh, and I was in there for over 20 years. Uh, you know, since the age of 15, I started very early. <laughs> okay. Uh, but you were I, I in a communistic a movement? You were in a Marxist movement of some kind? Well, um, again, you know, when I was about 15 years old, uh, I was reading a lot of stuff uh, very early for, for yeah, my age. And I read a lot of Marx, uh, Lenin, etc. And by the age of 20, 21, thereabouts, I don't remember exactly. I uh, was invited to join the Communist Party of Argentina, and I did join, and we had a little uh, group, a little uh, urban guerrilla, oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we, we were planning on doing um, operations. <laughs> operations, oh, okay, yeah. like, uh, like changing the world. Uh, well, like killing people. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah. It was, so as a reminder, uh, it, we, we cannot appeal for violence here. And so Bill Gates is, is saying this as a descriptive statement about his past. Uh, and of course, it is not an appeal to today's uh, action. All right. No, obviously, <laughs> things have changed a lot. If you look at, uh, you know, that second picture I sent you there, I don't know if you received all those pictures. Uh, oh, let me check. I, I don't think I did. Did you send them by email? Yeah, I sent them by email. If you look, uh, there, there's a second picture there, and that's the guy I followed. And, and the picture next to him shows how he ended up <laughs> in those days. It was pretty uh, pretty uh, heavy stuff. Okay, when you say the second picture, is it cu Cuban ta or dirty one? No, no. Uh, uh, you see Roberto Santucho there? You don't see him? I sent you eight pictures. I see El Crazy Che. Uh, extinction paper, Hong Kong, 
Yeah, but get... at the bottom you'll see all the pictures. Oh, okay, there they are. Oh, so yeah, I will not be number two. Okay, I will not be showing this to two. the audience, but this is a man whose face has been completely scraped off and scratched by some phenomenon of bullets. high violence. Bullets. Okay. Yeah, by bullets. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you were friend with up. this guy? No, no, um, I, he never knew me, I never knew him, but he had the organization called Ejército Revolucionario del Pueblo. Called, uh, what is it? People's, um, what? Um, uh, People's Army, uh, Revolutionary Army. Oh, yeah, that's always and, uh, how the communists title their stuff. Yeah, yeah, he was, he was a communist uh, by far. And the left side, you see how he was, and the right side, you see how he ended up when the... Uh, a uh, group of military caught up with him, you know, and they shot him down. Yeah, the bullets totally changed his look. Yeah, yeah, he was he was the first guy to die, and so was the captain that went to get him. They, they all shot each other in a room, essentially. They were shooting each other as communists? They were all communists? That, that was an internal fight or an external one? No, 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 no. What, what happened was, what happened was the uh, these guys were trying to get to Cuba. And uh, they were, uh, by the way, can I turn the Discord off here? Absolutely, you can. Okay, because I get all this interruption for these. Okay, and so what happened, uh, they were trying to get to Cuba, and uh, they were spotted, uh, or, or somehow uh, a military patrol heard about them, and uh, they went to this place, uh, like 10 guys, and they caught these gorillas in there, and there were like uh, eight of them. And it, it was just a shootout in a room. <laughs> it's like they opened the door and everybody just began, began shooting at each other. And, and the first guy to die was Roberto Santucho. And the first guy to die on the military side was the guy, the, the captain who was uh, running the patrol. So he became a martyr. <laughs> well, Bill, Bill, I feel all small suddenly because I was about to share my experience with communism, which was to be a Marxist for one year and arguing at the dinner table with my father about how the world was unjust to minorities. You're taking it to the next level. You are talking about communist mobsters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I'm talking about real stuff because uh, th th this was real stuff. You know, in the uh, 74, thereabouts, 1974, uh, you know, in my, where I lived, uh, there were, you could hear shots every night, every night somebody was dead, every night. It was uh, shootouts between the police and, and urban guerrillas. And the goal it was, was a mass to, movement. The goal was to instore a communist order, a, a kind of revolutionary action in Argentina. Yeah, there, there was a very uh, grassroots movement to overthrow the government of Perón. And uh, Perón had died. His wife, who was the vice president, became the president, and she was really no good. And so the military wanted her out. The workers wanted her out. Everybody wanted her out. And finally, the military uh, you know, made a coup, uh, Videla, and he started what is known as the Dirty War lasted many years, and during that time, I left Argentina, and then later on, I found out what they did, you know, with a lot of people. They tortured them. They they killed a lot of women who were pregnant. They took their babies. They gave them the military. A uh, big mess, and I missed all that. <laughs> you, you missed, missed all, all that? that because I had, oh, you missed. Okay. Yeah, I, missed, I, I missed all that because I went to the United States. Oh, yeah, and there uh, you were practicing uh, exchange of information. Uh <laughs> You were trying exactly. to equalize equalize the information. <laughs> was yeah, was this uh, was this driven by communism? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, I, uh, what what happened was I began to uh, take information out of Advanced Micro Devices, the company I worked for. Uh, they made chips, and they still make chips. And uh, that information, uh, the process information, how to make a chip what machines are used, the designs of the machines, the whole process, essentially the whole, you know, the whole store uh, went to Cuba, to Fidel Castro over a period of 12 years, uh, what, I think about 11 years. Uh, we just kept giving information to the Cuban government. The Cuban government would give that information to the Soviet Union. Oh, you were, you were directly involved. In, I didn't know that this exchange of information was to communist government. You're taking things at another level, Bill Gates, because oh, yeah, when I, yeah, when yeah, I was a teenager, 
when I was a teenager, my dream was to steal the the recipe for moose sausages from the butcher of my village. And I was like, it's un- it's unjust that such good sausages can only be produced by this man. And one day he was about to die. And I, I called him and I said, I want your sausage receipt for moose sausages. If you die, it's going to get out of the planet Earth and no one will ever get it. And this fucker died with the recipe. But you, you didn't let the, the <laughs> you didn't let the butcher die. You pumped the information out of him and you spread it to yeah. communist governments. Wow. Yeah. I, I was working through, uh, Fidel Castro, um, uh, uh, you know, giving information through their embassies. Essentially, what they would do, they would send a man over, uh, my controller, my handler. Uh, name His fake name was Julian Rosa. And later on, we found out his real name. But, he, you know, we would meet him uh, at the uh, border, uh, towns of Mexico uh, with Texas. I lived in Texas, in Austin, Texas at the time. So we would cross the border with my wife and with our car. And in the trunk of my car, I would carry all the stuff that I had copied. Cross the border, uh, give it to uh, Julian, and he would take it to the embassy. The embassy would, you know, package it and then ship it, uh, you know, by uh, diplomatic courier to, uh, to Cuba. And, you know, later on, Fidel Castro invited my wife and myself to Cuba. He, he invited us to Cuba. We went there to Cuba. We went there three times. And um, and we were taken to the place where they had all this information, which was in Pinar del Rio, on the western side of the island. When we went there, I couldn't believe there was a whole room full of this stuff. I mean, I gave them so much stuff. That's unbelievable. And they had like three or four people there who were translating all this stuff, I think, into Spanish. Uh, for one, but they I think they were also translating into uh, Russian, but I'm not so sure about that part. They eventually give this information to uh, the KGB guy. His name was Kriuchkov, one of the guys who later tries to overthrow uh, Gorbachev. And, uh, you know, a party of uh, Cubans went down and they were uh, they were very welcomed by the uh, KGB who thanked them. And uh, they said, yeah, that they had really, you know, had a big coup. Uh, in uh, penetrating uh, U.S. Um, uh, technology, you know, the way they would want to, you know, because Russia was very far, or Soviet Union was very far behind on technology uh, in, th- in several aspects. And chip technology was important because it ran the missiles and so on. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, with, with that, they, they caught up a little bit, you know, to the Americans. So what, what years so, are we talking about? Mm-hmm. Well, we're talking about uh, 1980 to 1992. So, uh, so it was part of the build-up in the Cold War. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Cold War, you could say, almost came to an end 1989. But um, for three that's more when years, Bill Gates stopped Cuba. working. Bill, G- Bill Gates took a pause of his work, and the Cold War ended. No, no. no I didn't. <laughs> Oh, you didn't. (laughs) No, that's that's the point. It's important to know that little transition. 1989, the Soviet bloc collapsed, you know, Germany, uh, East Germany collapsed, etc. And uh, and what was happening is that Cuba ran into trouble with Gorbachev. Gorbachev uh, was not going to help or subsidize Cuba anymore. And Fidel Castro was absolutely, you know, uh, uh, pissed about that. And uh, but I was still helping the Cubans. Okay. And they were not giving the information to Russia until, you know, they, they patched up their differences. Well, it turns out that, you know, then they had, uh, um, what was his name? I can't remember the guy who replaced Gorbachev now. Uh, Yeltsin, uh, Boris Yeltsin. And then, you know, the thing progressed to what we have today over there. You know, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, all the provinces turned into separate countries and Russia is what it is today. But the point is that, you know, I was helping the Cubans up to 1992. And after that, you know, uh, I went to the CIA and I turned myself in. And (laughs) just like the Cubans told me, I thought they were going to put me in prison. And now the CIA began working with me. So this turning yourself in, uh, what motivated this? Well, uh, that's a little weird story. I was in Cuba. And um, I may I befriended some of the um, intelligence officers. And in fact, one of the intelligence officers is the guy they traded in the days of Obama. 
that they okay. traded for Alan Gross. His name was uh, Rolando Sarraf Trujillo. We called him Rolly. And Rolly went to prison for 20 years in Cuba. <laughs> okay. And he's, he, he was in there for 20 years. He was traded by Obama. That's the guy that they traded for Alan Gross. And he's the guy that worked with me, and they put him in prison because of me. <laughs> That's how he ended in prison. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, when, uh, when I befriended these guys, they told me, look, we want to overthrow the Cuban government. And I just couldn't believe it. But that's, you know, that's the story they told me. I believed it. And they told me, look, we want you to go to the CIA. We're going to give you information to give the CIA. And we want to work with the CIA in secret to see if we can overthrow the Cuban government. And wow. since I was, you know, by that time, I was completely disillusioned with Cuba, with, with communism and Cuba specifically, I decided to turn myself in against the uh, advice of my wife. She objected. She didn't like that at all. But I went there. I went to the CIA building in Langley and uh, and I told them the story. And uh, 45 days later, the FBI came to my house. And from that time on, we worked for like two years and so you ended up uh, being charged, and did you spend time in jail? <laughs> How did that work? Well, uh, what happened was that uh, I started working at Intel with the knowledge of the FBI. Of course, they knew about it, but they never told Intel. And so Intel found out in a weird way about me. Turns out that the um, head of the security uh, of AMD, his name was Pete Costner. And you'll see the pictures there I sent you. Okay. Uh, Pete Costner put an ad in the um, in the uh, not an ad. It was like a wanted poster. Think of it that way. I don't know how they did it, but he put some kind of a wanted poster on me at the, uh, the what is it? The uh, Semiconductor Association in California. Which is Wait a, a minute, Bill. I'm looking at the pictures you sent me, and I see a false driver license from California. In oh, the I name of... I just I just gave you one sample. <laughs> I had like ten or fifteen. Or more. Wow, you were one of these international agents. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, during no, all this time, at... uh, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to show you where. Uh, what is? Uh, let's see if I can get the picture. Give me a, one second here. Uh, right. Yeah, it's the uh, picture number four. Yeah, All right. Number four. Look at picture number four. And that <laughs> is, uh, you can see there uh, the security managers of Intel and AMD. Uh, Steve Lund is the guy from uh, Intel and Pete Costner is the guy from AMD. And what Pete Costner did, he put an uh, like a wanted poster at the uh, uh, Semiconductor Association. And Steve Lund, who had just entered Intel as a security chief, he found out about that, and he discovered that I was working for him now. <laughs> and so he contacted the FBI, and the FBI, the, you know, the guys on the side there, the FBI guys, Jim King and Bob Baker, David Johnson, these guys there. Yep. And he notified them. And, uh, and so, you know, the FBI, what was the FBI going to tell him? Yeah, uh, we know. <laughs> And so uh, what Intel did was uh, uh, Steve Lund, he approached me and he says, look, we need for you to cooperate in an internal investigation. <laughs> and it turns out the internal investigation was an external one. They wanted really information on what I did at AMD. Now, and man. they said, if I didn't cooperate since I signed a confidentiality agreement, if I didn't cooperate with them, then what would happen is they would have to fire me. They would have to pull my badge. Well, I was put between the, the sword and the wall, you know, and, okay. uh, and so at that moment in time, I filmed the technology of, of Intel. What I did is I, uh, I, I was living in Arizona at the time, and I um, got into the, the Intel database in Albuquerque, New Mexico, filmed all the specs for the top of the line, the state-of-the-art chip, which was the Pentium at the time. And I took all this information to Argentina and sold it to the Chinese and the Iranians. <laughs> but Bill, I see in your picture there, there's a camera in the oven. Is this some yeah, sort yeah, of se the, is this yeah, before the Times cameras got smaller and that was the most secret you could get? <laughs> <laughs> that's that, that's a that's a secret camera before miniaturization. 
Well, I don't know if you can see this. I'm, I'm going to show it to you. I don't know if you can see it. This is the cassette. Re oh, you see. I don't know if you can see this. I, I still get that Discord stuff. Uh, Man, you're you're going to have to show it where your neck is if you want to be in the frame. Yeah, okay. exactly. Can you see this? Yeah, we can see okay, it. Okay, if you can see that, that's a little recorder. It's got the, uh, what is called the pickup cable. Okay, I don't know if you can see this. The, the yeah. pickup cable there. That That's what the and gangster finds in your belt and then he kills you. No, no, no. no? The issue is... You put this on a phone. Oh, you know, you put it on the on the receiver. Are you, and you can serious? Record any call. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And see, the cassettes are this little. See no. the cassette. This is this is wire typing from the eighties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Holy shit! And uh, and here's another. See, this is a pen that's got a. Uh, it's it's a cable. It's a pen that's got a cable to it. <laughs> and you would put it here, and you know, you you put it into the. Re you put the end. You know the the plug into yeah. the recorder, and and anyone who talked with you, you were recording him. Uh -huh. If he asked you to put a pen, you you would give him this pen, the other pen, <laughs> <laughs> and you kept this one there, and you could record him. I recorded the CIA with this. <laughs> you have a whole Batman cave of equipment. Oh yeah, yeah. Once you're in that business, you better get you better <laughs> buy the gadgets. <laughs> now, during all this time, you're getting paid directly in Bitcoin or what? No, no, no. Um, uh, by the Cubans, I was never paid. I did that for ideological reasons only. People have a hard time believing that. Oh, my God. You know, the communists you, always you get remember, the work for free. Yeah, you, you got to remember that when you're in that state of mind, you're a communist, you're a fanatic communist, uh, you do it for the heart. You do it for for the mind. You, you don't do it for the pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very hard for people to believe that today. But, yeah, that's that's the state of mind that you have. Wow. You're, you're hypnotized. And so with the Cubans for 10, 12 years, I did it completely free, no money in there, not, not at all. Uh, for the Chinese and uh, the Iranians, that's a different story. I had to do something different because I was getting back at Intel. That that was the reason. That was, did, this was did, vengeance. They had no reason to fire me because up to that point, I had done nothing to Intel. They just you, wanted information so that AMD could take me to, uh, you know, to court. That's did what I, they want. Did I hear the word uranium in what you said? Chinese uranium? Uh, no, you didn't no, no, say no, that. No, 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 no. No, no, okay. Uh, I misunderstood. So no, you were Iran. I'm saying no, uh, maybe I said Iran. Iran. Ah, okay. Chinese China and Iran. Iran. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I went to their embassies and uh I talked to their consuls and um uh about a month later, uh they had people from their countries, uh, engineers come over. And uh, we met at restaurants and, I, you know, I had given them the information, the uh, cassettes, which I had recorded. And I put them up to date verbally on what the cassette, you know, I complimented their education, you know, uh, personally. Uh -huh. Now, when you look at so, all this, is, is that a <laughs> common situation for the international CIA agents? to be so much on their own, to be subject to extortion, to be subject to reversal by their own team, and to be not sure if they're in the team of Intel or if the Intel is uh, investigating on them. Are there many U.S. agents out there that that were operating a little bit in that gray area between being kind of uh, corporate mercenaries and agents of the true U.S. government? I can only tell you what uh, Jim King told me, the FBI agent who handled my case. And he said once, he told me, he says, look, uh, I said, you know, we don't, uh, in fact, I haven't recorded. I, I got it on <laughs> on tape. In fact, uh -huh. I think it's in the, in the movie. And he said the following. He said, we don't care wh what the, these guys uh, are referring to the Cubans, right? We don't care what their motivation is. We don't care if it's ideological. Uh, you know, th they didn't care about that. They said, once we get to them, we'll turn them around. We we have the we have the means to turn them around, and I think that applies to any agent. I mean, imagine an American agent, and he's in Russia or in China, and you know they approach him and they give him a, a good deal, uh, mm -hmm. you know one that they can't refuse, or maybe they got him on the spot. Maybe they found him sleeping with, with he, someone he wasn't supposed to. That kind yeah. of thing, and so and so they begin to bribe him, they begin to extort him, and they could be you know, using that guy against his own government. So that, that does happen, not very frequently, but it could happen, sir. Now, looking back at this trade of information that you did, 
Uh, do you regret it? Do you think? Are, are do you are you still in the mood of spreading information? Do you have a mentality of free flow of information, like the Matrix, Joe Rogan style trip in some other dimension, or do you regret? <laughs> well, first of all, I don't regret what I did because um, I did it at a time I, I had a certain mentality, and I don't have that mentality anymore. So I did what I did when I did it, and I don't do that anymore. Well, I, now I spread a other type of information, physics. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's a different it's a different business now. <laughs> and you mentioned the uh, being a uh, disillusion with the dream of communism. What did you understand at some point in your life that made you say communism doesn't work? Well, you know, uh, when when one of my handlers came over, in fact, both of them, I had another one by the name of Luis Aguero later on. And, you know, we would meet in hotels and uh, in restaurants and so on, talk a, a while. And we would talk about politics. We would talk about the situation in Cuba and the Soviet Union, that kind of thing. And uh, over time, over the years, you know, we're talking about here 11, 12 years. Um, you know, a lot of things I didn't like about what I was hearing. You know, here here were uh, all these balseros, as they were called. The uh, they're still called, I guess, uh, like that. People who go with a little raft from Cuba and just escape to Miami or whatever. Yeah. And uh, and I said, why does it, Fidel, just let them go? You know, freedom. Uh, they want to go, let them go. And you and, said that uh, to Fidel know, they, Castro. No, well, I said that to the uh, handlers. You know, we would okay. have these talks with them, and and we would just discuss politics, philosophy, that kind of thing. And I said, why does he just let them go? You know, they want to leave the country, let them go. And, uh, you know, they, their argument was, well, you know, it's the United States who is, uh, uh, you know, fomenting this, uh, just encouraging people to leave the island for propaganda purposes. So they had this issue. And, you know, uh, uh, I didn't like the idea that they curtailed freedom. Same for the Soviet Union. So when Gorbachev came to power and he said, you know, Glasnost, Perestroika, this kind of thing, you know, a little more freedom. I said, well, this is the right guy. This guy's got this guy's got the right attitude because you know he's got to liberalize, you know, a little bit, you know, the uh, uh, the tight uh, noose that the communist government has over its people. And so when I go to Cuba, first really <laughs> the first stop was Czechoslovakia at the time, you know, um, and that was my first time I was uh, uh, came to a communist country. And the first thing you notice about a communist country is they have no food. <laughs> they, they have a big trouble getting food up on the table, you know, uh, for some reason. And, uh, you know, we noticed that immediately. And when we went to Cuba, we saw more of the same thing. You know, uh, food was a problem. And what really hurt me was not so much the food because we, we knew in advance that Cuba was a poor country. You can't expect a banana republic to, you know, put caviar on the table for everybody. And it turns out that you go there and you see privilege. That's that's the one that tricked me. You know that that's when that really got me because I said, "Hold it! Uh, you got people who belong to the Communist Party, and you know they are affiliated with the government, and they have all these perks, all these uh, privileges that the common man on the street does not have." And you see that, and you say, "Well, look, you know." And, and then another thing you see is prostitutes. You see prostitutes, you know, trying to make a living on the streets, and they don't do it. For money, that's the worst part. They do it for you know, a little money? bit of lipstick. They do it for lipstick. You know, you go ah. with the lipstick, you can buy half half the uh, you know girls in in Havana, and wow. so because you know they they absolutely crave uh, cosmetics. You can cut, you can bribe the entire country with cosmetics, really? and that's what we did with my wife. We bought a whole bunch of cosmetics and took it uh to cuba to friends and family there uh, my wife uh her uh, father is cuban and uh so we took it to the family and they the women just went nuts they they absolutely went out of their minds with all the cosmetics we took down there and I so you know, it's this. a country that start It's I had heard this uh, from someone things. who came to the USSR. I had heard that they were bringing jeans and jeans were extremely prized in the USSR because it was the only way to get them was to, to talk to an American tourist. Yeah, they crave all these things that they don't have. Food, uh, things, you know, material things, especially, right? And that was a big problem. And, uh, and but then within that society, you see privilege, you see people who have it, and people who don't. And the people who have it, it turns out, you know, they belong to the Communist Party. <laughs> uh -huh. So, you know, that's 
that's when you say, well, is this what I'm fighting for for free? I was doing it for free. So I'm saying, is this what I'm fighting for? Is this what Fidel Castro did, the revolution, overthrow Batista, Fulgencio Batista, to, to bring the same thing? And, and something else that you notice when you go to Cuba, you see this apartheid between uh -huh. Cubans and human beings. <laughs> There's a difference between them. If you go to a restaurant and the Cubans are on one side and the foreigners are on the other side, they, they can't mix. But if a Cuban brings a foreigner as a friend to eat to the, you know, invites him to the restaurant, the foreigner has to pay. <laughs> and he's got to pay a dollar. They won't let the Cuban pay. <laughs> and okay. pay so you, see all, you see a lot of that stuff and it's just, it's just tremendous. It bothers me a lot, you know. But and so you see all this stuff. You see privilege. You see uh, that the things don't work as you would think a socialist country should work. And then you know, uh, at one point, you just say, "No, the hell with all this." But in a lot of it's what not... you say, I I hear these communist countries were not the proper communist system. There is some ideal to be reached that could be reached. I mean. Do you see what I mean? I mean, we, we have a question on this. It's the pepper who says, why do communists always think Ma this time will be different? Are they genuinely stupid? Is that what you're telling us that ultimately you're not, you're not disillusioned with the ideal of communism, but that you didn't <laughs> like their implementation? Well, I got a lot to say about all that, that you just said you, there's so many aspects to it. The first aspect is that You know, no, no uh, revolution, the French Revolution, uh, the peasant revolt uh, in England, you know, all these all these movements, the Russian Revolution, all these movements, uh, people uh, have idealists uh, in their groups in this grassroots movement. Right. And they go out there with pick, uh, picks and forks and uh, pitchforks and, and they try to overthrow the government. Right. And so if they're numerous enough and they're lucky enough, they do overthrow the government. What happens next? Well, what happens next is someone takes over the government, becomes the new king, <laughs> mm -hmm. and you still have the pyramid. You never get rid of the pyramid. So I think it's an illusion, uh, you know, very illusory, very idealistic to think that any government can be overthrown and the workers are going to take over, which is what Marx essentially suggested, you know, the dictatorship of the proletariat, ju just impose a worker society where we're all equal. There's got to be a dictatorship because you, you have to control property, that sort of thing. But it turns out that the guys who take over power, look at what happened in Cuba, look at what happened in the Soviet Union, look at what's happening still in uh, North Korea. You still have the pyramid. You have one guy at the top who's got a limousine <laughs> and, and a lot of people on the bottom that don't have anything. And so you never get rid of that. And so I don't think so. So it's a nice ideal to think that, you know, humans can all be equal to each according to his uh, needs from each according to his ability. That sort of equality. It never happened, never will. It doesn't even happen in the plant world, let alone in the animal world. Uh, you know, I got plants. Uh, I grow plants. And you see one plant grow big and the other little guy next to it, you know, and he gets less sun. <laughs> the other guy gets all the, uh, you know, all the, um, uh, uh, what is it? The, uh, uh, the all, all the sun, you know. Yeah. Just, yeah. It, it, so, so one grows big and the other one go, grows small. Even within a plant, one leaf is big, one leaf is small. So you always see hierarchy. You never see equality across the board. I, I don't think it ever happened. Mother Nature never intended it. You know, Absolutely. so I had this illusion about humans living in peace and all being equal. There's no, no, you know, like John Lennon, you know, uh, imagine all the people living in this world, etc. It, it never happened, never will. It never will because, you know, you have to have this pyramid structure in the animal and plant world. I don't think uh, Mother Nature made any... Uh, provisions for equality. No, equality doesn't make sense uh, a priori unless there is an advantage in sharing and there is rarely in evolution. Uh, now, you seem to have been involved in technological stuff, mostly technological information and Uh, in relation to the communist governments, but we know that there are other international networks. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, of what was established around Jeff Epstein recently and discovered recently. And I'm thinking also about the networks of influence of Israel. Have you seen these things develop or were you just in your communist world and you didn't see that? 
No, I didn't see a lot of that because, you know, again, I'm, I was uh, focused on uh, what I was doing. I think I was pretty good at it because we were successful. And they, I don't know if they would have ever discovered us. Uh, you know, they, the only reason they discovered us is I turned myself in. They had no idea I was I even existed out there. And uh, so, you know, I was very focused on what I was doing. So, oh, you know, right. a lot of these things, I mean, there's a lot of things going on in the world. You, I can't be in touch with everything. But uh, all I can tell you is, uh, yeah, we were successful. It, it was a period of my life that's left behind a long time ago. Uh, it was adventurous. It was very nice. You know, the Cubans made passports for us. We, <laughs> we went with fake passports from country to country. You know, uh, it, it was a lot of fun. It was adventurous. It was nice. And again, we did it mainly for ideological reasons, and we were in a position to do so. And you know, so but after that, when you when you're saying, rest, what am I doing all this for? You know, that's when you start asking questions. When I see you admit all these crimes, I'm thinking, uh, for the rest of your life, you don't plan traveling, right? I travel constantly. Oh, you travel <laughs> constantly? I just came from Argentina. <laughs> you don't give a shit. <laughs> I mean, I thought that when you were admitting that many crimes on the public space that you couldn't go uh, in much places, that they would catch you and they would, they would take your admission as evidence. No, I'm, I'm at peace with everyone. Uh, I don't know, maybe the Cubans might still want to do something to me, but I doubt it, uh, you know. Uh, with the Yanks, uh, I'm at peace. You know, they put me in prison for three years. Um, yeah, but, you know... Uh, I have no, I'm not in touch with them or anything. I, they're not interested in me as far as I know. <laughs> so no, I'm, I don't think there's any problem. All right. Very I, I'm interesting. Not, I don't fear it. I'm not looking over my shoulder, you know, <laughs> finding out what's now, going on. Now, are you following the current political situation when you see the Democrat Party, Elizabeth Warren, Andrew Yang? Are you tempted by the universal basic income of Andrew Yang as a form uh, of semi-communism? I'm not I'm not into politics anymore. And the okay. main reason uh, I don't, you probably heard of my theory. My theory says that we're the last humans on Earth. Oh, yeah. You, you believe that we're headed toward extinction? Civil war? Yeah, we're, we're I think we're at the doorstep of our extinction because I think the global economy is going to collapse. Once it collapses, no one produces food or distributes foods to the cities. That's what I think is going to happen. That's a mass extinction. Eight well, billion people die in a matter of weeks. I mean, uh, the, the food system is quite reliable in distant countries. Uh, I mean, on the country only, side. Only because of money. Only because of money. I mean, when I money disappears, though, when money disappears, there's no more food. I think you've been hanging out too much downtown uh, because <laughs> I know what, everybody thinks, just, they think just drive crazy. two hours from any big city. And what you see is a network of people essentially trading tomatoes for potatoes, for lumber, for the winter. And they could they could make an abstraction of money to some extent. It, it's quite simple to capture. That, the whole thing, the whole thing is driven by money in the end. Without money, there is no food. No one produces food without money. No one. <laughs> well, th okay. th there is still something like a communist in you, Bill Gates. <laughs> you, you are ultimately afraid of capitalism the way Karl Marx was. No, no, I'm, I'm just uh, reasoning that um, uh, for several reasons we're, we're at the end of the line. One is we've lost our genetic diversity. So we can't go very long from a biological standpoint. The other one is our population pyramid has started overturning in 1963 steadily. Uh, year after year, we have uh, fewer, um, um, what is it, birth rates. Okay, Year after year, the birth rate is falling. The United Nations demographers predict that if everything continues as it's going so far, and it's been going on for the last 50 years, by mid-century, uh, we reach zero population growth. One person is born, one person dies. You know, there's no increase in population on the planet. Uh, so those things are in the background. But I'm saying that's not what's going to cause our extinction. Our extinction is going to be caused because money will be no more. The global economy will collapse. It can't grow forever, especially if population is declining. Money is there as long as people need a unit to trade, right? Uh, money is there because we created this abstraction called money. We had all kinds of money throughout history. We had bartering. We went to gold. We went to paper. And now we're in uh, numbers in a computer. That's that's what Bill Gates is worth. 
He's worth uh, whatever he's got, whatever number he's got in a computer. That's it. We're and beyond that. Bill Gates. Like, and We've reached Bitcoin. And Bitcoin but, is yeah, the is another, summon. Another electronic coin. But the point here is that these are uh, these are this is money. But money is an abstraction. Money has no intrinsic value. And the only thing that keeps the entire system in the world on the planet going is money. If God wants to kill man tomorrow, all he's got to do is somehow erase all the money in the world, right? He erases all the money. Who's going to, what agricultural corporation, which produces at least 50% of the food on the planet, what agricultural corporation is going to produce food without any money? I mean, I know a couple of guys who would continue producing tomatoes as long as the guy who makes the lumber brings them lumber. Yeah, and, and uh, so I, I produce food too. Uh, you know, one thing is to produce food for yourself, which is not even possible so easy today, uh, especially not in your apartment. Everybody's got an apartment these days. Most of the people uh -huh. live in the city, so most of the people would die. Oh, yeah. uh, but uh, nobody's got a, a farm. It's the corporations which have farms today. And, and in fact, uh, uh, I think uh, one of the reasons uh, Trump um, has no problem with what's going on with China, for example, is that he doesn't care if the uh, little farmer loses his farm and goes to the cities because who's going to buy it? The, the corporation. And as long as the big corporations buy out their farms, he doesn't care if a lot of... Uh, Uh, farmers lose their farms, uh, you know, individual farmers lose their farms and go to the city. That's happened in history many times. So I don't think that's why I don't think they care. They subsidize them with some money. Whoever can live can live. And then that guy who loses uh, his farm because he can't pay the uh, mortgage or, or the loan that he got from the bank, he loses his farm. They don't care because the farm is taken by a big corporation, which now has uh, economies of scale applied to it and can produce probably more efficiently and cheaper whatever they're producing. And so they don't care. But the, my point is that agricultural corporations produce the majority of food. They don't go out there and barter. Believe me, they, they do it for money only. No money, no food. No All distribution. Right. Well, let me tell you that I pers I'm personally very enthusiastic about the future you described because something tells me that my personality is more adjusted to a zombie apocalypse and that I would be okay. better in, in, in a shotgun shooting waves of zombie humans coming at me <laughs> than just, just a YouTuber with IDs. Fernando Covet uh -huh. says, Bill did what he did before rope came to town. Uh, that, that's one question I add. The, the transition between that part of your life where you were doing all the central and electronics to the uh -huh. rope theory, how did that happen? Was this a progression? Did the rope came uh, progressively in your mind or was it just like a, a big roll of rope just dropping into your brain? <laughs> well, uh, the first thing, I was in prison when I developed the rope model and oh. it came out of uh, the issue with God. Uh, nothing to do with physics, really, to start out with. You know, I, I come from a very strong atheist uh, uh, background. My family was atheists. They were militant atheists. Uh, my, uh, we were living in Baltimore when uh, the, uh, what's her name, uh, Madeline Murray O'Hare. I don't know if you heard about her. She was the founder of American Atheists. Okay. And she was a friend of ours. She would come to our house. And uh, she recruited my, my father and mother. And uh, we joined her organization very early when she was just starting out. And so we were we always talked about, uh, you know, religion at home, politics and religion. And uh, we talked about the Bible. We were very well versed in uh, Christianity and Bible and all that kind of stuff. But from the other point of view. So when I go to prison, you know, I, I, I knew my my uh, Bible. I knew it. I, I read it three times completely. You know, so so I knew my Bible very well. And you find all these guys who committed crimes out there, you know, they, they do primarily drugs. Mm -hmm. They come in there and suddenly they find God in prison. You know, they, they become born again yeah. Christians or born again Islamists. And so I had talks with these guys. And of course, I found out that they didn't even know their own books. They, they never read the Bible. They never read the Quran. Oh, Bill, and yeah. so, you know, we would. We you were the party we pooper in prison, shutting down the, the awakeness of these men to, to the truth of Jesus. <laughs> I can't There believe you go. it. And, and so, you know, we had discussions and uh, and, I, and one day, you know, uh, a couple of times, in fact, they said, well, prove to me that God does not exist. And so I said, oh, okay. And I said, I I'm going to find a good answer for this. And that's when I started looking into physics. 
And when I look in physics, I find black holes, Big Bang, and all this nonsense that I hear about uh, time dilation, going back and killing your grandfather, and you know, and all this nonsense that they have out there. And I said, no, this is forget about religion. This is religion. This is true religion. <laughs> And that's when I started investigating. I said, well, look, if I'm a rational guy, how come I cannot rationalize how this universe works? I should be able to know what light is, what gravity is, what magnetism is, what electricity. I should be able to explain it in a rational manner. And that's when I started researching. And after about a year and a half, I came up with the idea of the rope. I said, ah, you know, uh, the rope. <laughs> and, and that's what I have to this day, you know, the rope. <laughs> <laughs> A torsion along the rope. That's what light is. Wonderful. Thomas Howard says, This guy's insight on plant hierarchies is very perceptive. Reminds me of Jordan Peterson. Don't hate my take on this, Jeff. Well, that, that, that's a very nice compliment, Bill Gates. You may be on your way yeah. to becoming a millionaire if you have these Jordan uh, Peterson yeah. qualities. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thomas Howard says, the guest believes in a coming economic collapse. JF believes we will be turned into a component of a more advanced genetic form as mitochondria and chloroplast were. All I know is something is coming. Nietzschean modernist <laughs> says, viva General Pinochet, viva General Strassner, free helicopter rides. Wow. That is, uh, that is quite something. KA says, Bill, uh, was your needle experiment replicated? The, the what? The needle experiment? needle experiment. Oh, well, uh, anyone can. Uh, it's a simple experiment that anyone can do. Uh, he's talking about the double slit experiment, and you don't need double slits. And I guess people in the universities never figured that out. Turns out that the slit experiment was performed originally uh, by um, uh, Grimaldi and later on by Newton. And he put a hair, he put a hair and he shone a light uh, through the hair and he created the uh, fringes. And then Thomas Young repeats the experiment uh, a century later in uh, 1800 and he does it with a double slit. But the uh, third experiment that uh, Thomas uh, Young does is with a hair also. He, uh, that's why I call it the Newton, you know, the Newton hair experiment. I don't consider it mine, I consider it Newton's. And if you put a needle, in front of a laser pointer, very simple experiment. Just put uh, the needle in a cork, you know, just stick it in a cork, put it there, shine the uh, laser pointer to it, and you'll see the fringes on the on the screen on the, you'll see on the wall or whatever. Is that what we see? So some you can do waves. That at home. Very simple experiment. What you see is it the interference pattern or the the full yeah, pattern? Yeah, you don't you don't need slits. And the question is, you can't do that with particles or with waves. You can't do it. The only way with a rope. With a rope, you can explain it, but you can't explain that with with particles. No way. So the Absolutely. needle experiment because, because is it that, like you know oh, why? Go ahead. It, it, see, let, let let me show you something real quick. Yeah. Let's say that's the needle. That's my beer bottle. Okay. okay. And and uh, the particle will hit will hit here and will hit here, right? Uh -huh. And it'll bounce and it'll go outwards. It it'll never bounce against the edge and go inwards to uh -huh. interfere with the other particle. Yeah. So you can't do it with particles. But then you, you can, can with, with waves. Rope because all, all the atoms are interconnected with a rope. So you can do it with a rope. You can't do it with particles or with waves. But 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 what you said does annihilate the possibility of a particle. But then what about a wave? A wave could go around the bottle of beer. On, only if it's like a water wave. And the question is, what kind of wave are we talking about? What is this wave? I mean, there is no physical object called a wave. you got to identify the 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 uh, object that is waving what is waving they say it's particles so we're back to particles wow i mean what bill is water Gade, water's particles bill Gade water comes on the public space atoms. he comes on the public space once again and i end up being more and more convinced that particles don't exist but i no, have not course, discarded yeah. waves yet well, I'll, I'll discard waves for you. In fact, I've had a couple of videos lately. The waves are particles. What is wavy? They say it's particles. What is the ether? Particles. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you, you're, yeah, this whole idea that a wave needs to be in something. Right. You got to identify the physical object. And in it's the a case quantum waves, field. It's particles. A quantum field? It's, it's Would particles. that work? You can have a I'm wave sorry, of what, quantum fields. 
well, what is a field? Please identify what a field is. See, they never define the word field, and they say, oh, it's the field that's vibrating. So what's a field? What's well, energy? What are mathematically these Mathematically defined are property. No, they're spirits. It's like saying the spirit uh, way of vibrating. So what do you mean by spirit? Well, it's, you know, it's a spirit. You know what a spirit is, right? That's all they say. What is a field? What is energy? These words have never been defined. Uh, Frank De Silva, at, at object. Frank De Silva is object. asking, Bill, how exactly were you recruited by government agents? Through academia or political networking? No, no, no. Uh, I was not recruited. I went to the embassy and, and uh, presented myself. I, I, I gave a show. I gave a little show to the consul. You know, so he, he listened to me and said, this guy is offering me technology. And uh, that's how it worked. And, you know, a few <laughs> months later, they, they sent uh, someone to my house in Sunnyvale, California, where I live. And that's when they said, look, we need for you to go to Mexico. And we went there with my wife and we met our handler. And from there, we started working. You, you went to an embassy located in the U.S.? No, no, no. In Argentina. No? The first in one Argentina. in Argentina. The second one. Well, no, hold it. I, I went there twice. The first guy didn't do anything. The second guy I went to the interest section of the uh, of uh, the Cuban interest section, which was located inside the Czechoslovakian embassy in Washington, D.C. So we went to Washington, D.C. with a whole bunch of material, wafers, uh, manuals, all kind of stuff. And I gave a show to the um, I don't know if he was a consul or what he was, uh, but he was the head of the embassy or the interest section. I gave a presentation to him. He liked the idea. And six months later, they sent uh, someone to my house in Sunnyvale and they said, look, the Cuban government wants you to go to Mexico. And that's what we did. We went to Mexico and we met with their uh, representatives. Now, Bill Gade, I was married three times and all of my wives <laughs> leave me for drinking too much Diet Coke or for sleeping at 11 p.m. instead of 10 p.m. How the heck did you have a wife through this that followed you on all these international adventures and didn't leave you. I got a great wife. Yeah, I love her very, very much. We've been married, what, 40, uh, too long. <laughs> <laughs> We've been married 40 some years, yeah. All now right. We get along great. Uh, Frank De Silva says, thanks, Bill, for your answer. Uh, I will be <laughs> headed toward uh, covering some news solo, but it was great hearing your story, Bill. Was there anything else you wanted to discuss tonight? No, no, uh, but uh, if they have questions, you know, they can put up to you and you can send them to me. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Okay, we'll bye see bye. you, uh, Bye-bye. What a story. I didn't expect this. I was like, today I was like, okay, I need to prepare a discussion about communism. All I knew was Bill Gates is going to come and he's going to talk to you about communism. And I was like, okay, let's talk about how communism is bad. <laughs> I, was, I was prepared to make some political arguments, but he comes with this freaking crazy story. Oh my God, how amazing is it? to be speaking again with Bill Gade. Wow. Uh...